Good morning, church family. Welcome to Centenary United Methodist Church. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's so good to see all of your bright, shiny faces. And welcome also to those who are following us online this morning. Please silence your cell phone as we start our service. Make sure you read all the announcements in the bulletin. Each pew has a white response card in it. On one side is a place for prayer requests. On the other side is a place for you to request information about our church if you're a first-time visitor. And if you are visiting with us, welcome home to Centenary. We're glad you're with us today. Also note the QR code on that card if you'd like to do all of that online. Uh, there will be a Stephen minister at the uh, front of the church at the altar to pray with you or speak with you at the conclusion of the service for anyone who needs that. Just a few announcements today. First, don't forget the reception after the 11 o'clock service to welcome our two new associate pastors, both of whom are here today. Carol Grantham is here. Tyler Moore is here. And uh, we welcome them into worship leadership along with Pastor David as we begin this new season at Centenary United Methodist Church. Uh, we need front desk volunteers during the week, folks. People to sit at the desk, uh, greet people as they come in, and use the phone and route those phone calls into the office. It's very easy to do. You can get trained in about five minutes as to how to use those phones. But we do need folks. We're a little short right now. And uh, if you're interested in uh, coming once a week or once every other week for about half a day and sitting at the desk and greeting people, we would love to have you. Speaking of volunteers, Vacation Bible School, we still need snacks for our volunteers. We have plenty of food for the kids. We don't have snacks for our more than 40 volunteers. So if you'd like to buy some snacks and bring them by the church, we would appreciate it. Uh, setup starts this afternoon, and then we start in earnest tomorrow morning with our Vacation Bible School. This year, their mission focus is the Colonial Capital Humane Society. And in last week's bulletin, and I believe on our website and in Friday greetings, you'll find a list of the items that we are requesting to donate to the Humane Society. The kids were very ex are usually very excited about that mission project. Those are all the announcements I have today. Do any of you have anything that you need to lift up at this point in the service? Yes. Okay. Sign-up sheets for prime timers, to the trip to Triumph Palace on the uh, 20th. Sign-up sheets are out in the lobby of this, of the chapel. Or they're also out in front of the, the, the narthex of the sanctuary. Okay, thank you. Brothers and sisters, God is always doing a new thing, whether we perceive it or not. May all of our eyes and ears be opened to the work of our creative God, today and always. Amen.
Good morning. Please stand as able and join me in our opening prayer. Steadfast God, you embrace us as a living parent and patiently love us beyond measure. May we offer that same kindness to all we encounter, knowing it is Christ who we greet as we welcome others. Amen. Our first hymn is 421, Make Me a Captive. Good morning. The first reading this morning is from Isaiah chapter 58. Shout out, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Announce to my people their rebellion and to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet day after day they seek me and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. 
They ask me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, you serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all your workers. You fast only to quarrel and to fight and to struggle with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day of humble oneship? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this fast a day acceptable to the Lord? Is it not the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of injustice, <clears throat> to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your righteousness shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom shall be like noonday. The Lord will guide you continually, giving you water when you thirst and restoring your strength. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water, whose water never fails. The Holy Scripture, Holy Gospel this morning is from Matthew 10. <clears throat> Whoever comes, whoever welcomes you, welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Friends, good morning. Please be seated. For the avoidance of doubt, my name is uh, Tyler Moore. I am the new, one of the new associate pastors here at Centenary United Methodist Church. And I'm happy to be here with y'all this morning. 
I'm going to invite you to pray with me, and y'all will learn one of my quirks is that when I prepare to pray a, a prayer before our sermon, I, I start just like we do communion. I'm going to say, the Lord be with you, and you're going to say, and also with you. Right. So friends, the Lord be with you. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I don't know how many of you are movie fans. I will admit that I'm not a huge movie fan, but I like sports movies. And in the movie We Are Marshall, there's a scene where Matthew McConaughey is introduced as the new head football coach at Marshall University following the tragic plane crash that had killed the previous head coach, most of his staff, the players, the support staff at Marshall University. And in that scene during the opening press conference, McConaughey's character says when they arrived in their new home there in West Virginia that the electricity worked, the water pressure was high, there was a six pack of beer in the fridge, and a pound cake on the counter. He went on to say, four for four, we appreciate the hospitality, we, we really do. Now, when Mallory and Kate and I moved into our home in Newburn a couple of weeks ago to begin selling it, there, there wasn't a six-pack of beer in the refrigerator. <laughs> I'll leave it to y'all to work out the wisdom of that decision in your own good time. <laughs> but the electricity worked, the water pressure was high, and there wasn't a pound cake on the counter, but a lot of food started rolling in. Fried chicken tenders and watermelon and cantaloupe and deviled eggs and potato salad and peach bread, all sorts of stuff started to roll in, courtesy of, of all of you, the good people of Centenary. My wife, and Ma my wife Mallory and my daughter Kate and I appreciate your hospitality. We really do. And we thank you for how you have welcomed us home here to Centenary. It's precisely because you have extended that welcome to us that I was so excited when I saw the worship schedule for the month of July and saw that last Sunday Van passed over the assigned lectionary text, doing that very unmethodist thing of passing up the lectionary, which meant I could do that very unmethodist thing of, of skipping the lectionary text for this Sunday and backing up to the gospel reading that you just heard, read, because it was assigned for last Sunday. These verses that close out chapter 10 of Matthew's gospel end Jesus' instructions to the 12 disciples who he is commissioning for ministry in his name, proclaiming that the kingdom of heaven has come near. It's the passage of scripture from which we draw the phrase, shake off the dust from your feet when leaving a place that, that maybe you have not been received and welcomed well. I don't think there's any danger of me having to do that here. <laughs> and in chapter 10, Matthew records all of these things that Jesus says is going to happen to his disciples. He, he anticipates all these trials and tribulations that, that his disciples will experience. Inhospitality, beatings, separation from friends and family. But he closes the gospel, chapter 10, with, with what we'll call a word of hope. In effect, he says, in my paraphrase, look, I know things are going to be tough, but whoever welcomes you welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Now, Jesus isn't charting a new course here. This is not one of those, you've heard it said, but I say passages of Scripture. Jesus is drawing on the depths of his tradition. I invite y'all to think back to the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis where Abraham welcomes two strangers and entertains angels unaware. Think about the law which instructs the Israelites, the people of God, to welcome the strangers and foreigners residing in their lands, to the, to the prophet's call to justice and welcome, like what you heard from the book of Isaiah this morning. And then on to the epistles, where Paul instructed the church in Rome to welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you. 
Welcome and hospitality are at the center of our lives as disciples of Jesus. Not because we're good, upstanding, moral people, but because God in Christ has first welcomed us. When I came to be with the pastor parish, the staff pastor parish relations committee, I came from a small church where we were, where I was a staff of one, so it was just a PPRC. <laughs> uh, the staff pastor parish relations committee, um, and I received a goodie bag, and in it was a book, uh, the book y'all produced last year to commemorate 250 years of Methodist ministry here at Centenary. And, and I was reading the history of the many examples of, of the graceful hospitality extended by this congregation to people for the last 251 years. And I read in the very beginning that this church exists precisely because of hospitality extended by the people of Newburn who would eventually compose this congregation. I don't know how many of you are familiar with your own church's history. Far be it for me to tell you about your own church. I just got here. But I read that in 1772, Joseph Pilmore, a colonial Methodist pioneer, arrived unexpectedly on Christmas Eve in 1772. Spending the night, he got up on Christmas Day, went to an Anglican church and celebrated communion. And... He recorded in his journal that he, he preached a 6 p.m. sermon on the courthouse steps to a hastily assembled congregation. And then he said, and I quote, several, in the, several of them, that is the, the congregation that was there, several of them invited me to their houses and behaved with the utmost politeness and civility. Mr. William Wood took me home with him, and I had everything my heart could desire. From that Christmas Day welcome, this faith community was born. And I continued on reading about how you have been a beacon of hospitality and welcome for the Newburn community from that point onward. Whether it was uh, opening your doors to uh, youth who needed some help with the after school program here, or opening your doors to the people who were recovering from Hurricane Florence, or even opening your doors to, to new people into the life of this church because of the great unpleasantness, as one of my friends has described it, besetting the United Methodist Church. Since 1772, this congregation has been a place of welcome. And that, my friends, is impressive. Because these days, it's much easier to find reasons not to have to welcome people than reasons to have to welcome people. We often struggle to, to welcome people who, who don't look like us or, or make as much money as us or, or act like us or think like us or speak like us or vote like us. But the gospel calls us to make no such distinction. We are simply called to be people of welcome. And if not for the welcome of a United Methodist Church, I wouldn't be here standing before you this morning. By the end of this sermon, you might be thinking, well, maybe, maybe I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> when I was eight years old, my parents separated and eventually concluded that separation with a divorce. Uh, their marriage was the first of many casualties of my mother's battle with addiction, which plagued her for, for more than a decade. And as the dust settled on the divorce when I was nine or ten years old, my dad decided we needed to find a church home. We, we needed to get back into church, in his words. We had attended another uh, congregation when I was very young, baby, one, two, three, four years old. But as things began to unravel with their marriage, the church kind of fell to the, the wayside. And so one Sunday, we went to worship at the church that my father had been raised in, Chestnut Ridge United Methodist Church. Some of you might know Chestnut Ridge because of the camp that shares the name. Chestnut Ridge was and still is a small country church in Eflund, North Carolina, rural Orange County, less than 10 minutes from my home. That explains the accent that you <laughs> hear this morning. That first Sunday, I was terrified. 
didn't know what to do. It had been years since I'd been to church. I didn't remember what I did when I was four, much less what I did when I went to church. I didn't know what to do. I, 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 I didn't know the Lord's Prayer. I didn't know the Apostles' Creed. I, I, I didn't know that the bold print meant I was supposed to talk. I didn't know the difference between the United Methodist hymnal and the faith we sing. I didn't know what to do. I was so nervous on that first Sunday I was there in worship that I didn't come forward when they did the children's moment. Early in the service, they had a children's moment, invited all the kids to come down forward for a little quick lesson on their level. And I just didn't go down. But after the lesson was concluded, that particular Sunday, they gave all the kids a book. I learned later they usually gave candy, little smarty wrappers with Bible verses on them. But this Sunday, for whatever reason, they were giving away books. And so the other kids that went down got their books, went kind of scurried back to their pews. And after all the other kids had gone back to sit down, the Reverend Patricia Sykes, Pastor Pat, as she's belovedly known, very, without calling me out, without making me feel bad for not having gone down, said, if there's any child who didn't get a book, he wants one. They're welcome to come down and get one. So I scurried up there, got my book, and quickly retreated back to my dad's side. Through that small act of, of invitational hospitality, she, she welcomed me, and that church became my home. In that simple act of a pastor giving me a book, I, I had everything my heart could desire. That church went on to, to, to help raise me. It loved my father and I through a difficult time as, as we dealt with, with my mother's addiction and, and, and the end of, of my parents' marriage. But in time, that church came to love my mother too. As she began her journey out of addiction, she became a part of that church family too. And despite all that they had heard and seen that her addiction had done to my father and I, they, they welcomed her with open arms. And as of this past Tuesday, July the 4th, 2023, my mother has been drug free for 13 years. And as of this coming October, my parents will celebrate their eighth re-anniversary, if you can call it that. <laughs> they, they got remarried after mom's addiction lost out to God's grace. Chestnut Ridge was the church that confirmed a call in my life before I even recognized one in myself, or at least before I admitted it to myself. I don't think there are many people that initially say, yes, God, that's exactly what I want to do. I want to go be a preacher. Take some warming up to that idea. I had been the, the youth at Chestnut Ridge, it was kind of the oldest in my cohort, and in a small church, when you're the oldest of your little cohort of youth, that means you get to do all the things. When they need a youth representative on some committee or other, they go, well, Tyler can do it. <laughs> we need a youth representative on the PPRC committee. Well, Tyler can do it. Which made me quickly say, I don't want to be a preacher. <laughs> There's a picture in my office of me standing in the pulpit of Chestnut Ridge United Methodist Church speaking during a children's Christmas program. When I was in high school, Miss Joyce Clayton, one of the dear saints of that church, gave me that framed picture and told me she wanted me to have it so that when I became a preacher, I would have a picture of the first time I spoke from a pulpit. Now, again, at that time, that was the last thing on my agenda. I was going to be going off to East Carolina University to get my history education degree and go teach high school history somewhere. And so off to ECU I went to do exactly that. During the fall of my freshman year, I was walking from my dorm room at the west end of campus at East Carolina. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that campus, but I lived in Garrett Residence Hall, which is now at the west end of campus, close to downtown. Don't make any assumptions about that geography. Thank you for laughing at that. I'm glad y'all got that. And so I lived in West End and was having to walk all the way to the Brewster Building at the other end of main campus down at the bottom of College Hill because I was taking history classes. That's where all history classes were. And I was walking across campus by the mall and the cupola. And I heard.
started this commotion, I'm shouting and carrying on. And I was a freshman. I thought, well, you know, I'd left in plenty of time for class. I wasn't going to be late. You know, I didn't want to be that guy. And so I was walking. I had plenty of time. I said, well, let me go see what's going on. And I found there a man in dress pants and suspenders and a tie, and he was, I guess we'll call it, preaching to anyone who would listen. I learned his name is Brother Ross. His preaching, if you can call it that, basically involved telling everyone within earshot why they were going to hell. It's like the, I pictured the cartoon, you know, where the little, the little lever pulls, you know. Have a tattoo? Going to hell. <laughs> Girl wearing shorts? Going to hell. Guy with long, long hair, tat, piercings, whatever. Despite the pictures of Jesus with the long hair we have all over the church. After standing there and listening for a few minutes, I eventually walked on to class. Walking across campus, the shouting faded. I thought about how I had been loved and welcomed by the people of Chestnut Ridge United Methodist Church. I wasn't perfect. My life was far from perfect. And yet, that church welcomed me with open arms. And seeing Brother Ross in action made me realize, a light bulb went on that, that made me realize that, that the loving and welcoming experience I had had in my home church was maybe not the experience everybody had with church. Indeed, I, I thought maybe for some of those college students that day, being harassed by Brother Ross is the only kind of encounter they will ever have with Christianity and the church, that kind of holier-than-thou condemnation of them. And so, friends, I might be preaching to the choir here, as it were. <laughs> but we Christians, as any denomination or group, cannot make space for the transformative power of the Holy Spirit to be at work through us and through our churches if we do not welcome others as though we are welcoming Christ himself. We cannot be a place where people encounter the love and grace of God if people do not first encounter love and grace in and through us. In the words of the late author Rachel Hale Evans, this is not a table for the worthy, but for the hungry. The guest list is not ours to make. So friends, I am excited to be here with you in a church with such a heritage of hospitality since 1772. And I look forward to the ways that I can come alongside you and the work you are already doing so that we might continue to build on that heritage to be a refuge of welcome in a world that can feel all so unwelcoming. I'm excited to be here at a church where you say to all, welcome home. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And now I've got to do my one last job before I escape from here and go to the 9 o'clock service. I'm learning the rhythms of, of worship here. Um, I invite you to stand as you are able and join in our hymn of response number 432, Yezu, Yezu.
Can you hear me now? Yes, you can hear me now, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> we won't worry about what I look like right this second. Oops. All right. Does anybody have any other joys they'd like to share this morning? Oh. Um, okay, Pam.
everybody up there. <laughs> Are there concerns? Oh, I'm sorry, yes, ma'am. I can hardly see you. Yes. Wonderful. That's wonderful. We just got back from sharing uh, time with family, too, and that's a blessing when we can do it, right? Amen? Yes. Right. Yes, ma'am. Charles Sykes. That's a hallelujah, is that? <laughs> so yes, we want to be, uh, and there he is, in prayer for our Charles, for Charles Syke and the entire family. We want to be, lift up Bill Taylor as well. All Bill those, who I'm sorry. Remember yes. Carolyn Sharp, who is part of the choir, is in the choir, and will have church on Tuesday for a, a mass Absolutely. Thank you, Paul. Let me name some others here uh, that are beloved to us. We want to lift up Don Hodges as well, be in prayer for him, for the family, for Ruth Waters, all those that are at home. We want to continue to pray for Rich Meyer and others in rehab or in nursing homes. Uh, and we've learned that Bobby Spitzer had emergency surgery, so we want to be in prayer for him as well. Are there others we would like to lift up this morning that we haven't named? Let us pray. Gracious God, you are a God of hospitality. There is none like you that invites all to come to you. You have invited all to your home, to your table, and to your arms. Lord, help us to remember that no one is better than anyone else in your kingdom. Generous God, because you treat us with your tender love, we pray for our friends, family members, and others who need you more than ever. Pour out your healing on all who need it, be generous with their transforming love for those whose needs, who need it in their lives. We pray for those people who are in need of our prayers, for those who are ill or anxious, for those who are lonely or sad, for those who are despairing, for those who make our own. Giving God, you give us all that we need to further your kingdom and to be the body of Christ in the world. Empower us to continue to be your hands and feet, to do the work that needs to be done here and in so many other places. There is none like you, God, in your love, your generosity, and your hospitality. We thank you daily for your tender mercies. We thank you daily for your love. We thank you daily for your grace. And we thank you daily that you are in our lives, working in us and through us to let people know your kingdom is open to all. We pray all these things in the name of the one who opens the doors and breaks down barriers that keep people from you. We pray through Jesus who taught us to say together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Lord, we want to worship you not just with our words, but with our hearts and with our lives. May we offer the best of ourselves and our blessings as a gift to you. Amen. <clears throat> our Lord invites to his table, broken your law, forgive us, we pray, free us for joyful obedience, through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Let us take a moment to pray in silence. Proves God's love toward us in the name of Jesus. Now let us offer.
Yes. <laughs> and also with you. Hurry. Always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, living sacrifice, in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. 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 And now come, the meal is prepared. Thank you. 